Okay, we can get started. Um, welcome to the uh, Yocta Project and Open Embedded uh, BOF. Uh, my name is Armin Custer, and I uh, work for Monta Vista Software. Um, I've been working on the Yocta Project for about six, seven years. Um, I'm on the uh, technical steering committee for the Yocta Project, and I'm the uh, stable branch maintainer for Pocky and uh, Meta Open Embedded. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nicolas Duchesne. I work for uh, Linaro. I'm uh, the uh, committee manager for the Yocto project, so we definitely want to thank you all uh, for being here today. Um, I've been involved with the project with, uh, for, for a couple of years as well, and uh, we, we do this both at every of these uh, ELC, ELC conference, so we have, I mean, this is usually I mean, the time where uh, we really uh, want you to uh, ask questions to uh, the developers and, and, and the Yocto project people. So today, what we are, we are going to start with a couple of um, <coughs> uh, information that we want to share about uh, project updates and status update, and then uh, hopefully it will be quite quick, and we'll open up for questions. Uh, so we have a few uh, people from the project in the room, so hopefully we can answer the questions, and if we cannot answer the questions, we'll get you the answers uh, as soon as we can. A uh, couple of project up updates. Uh, so this is... Uh, a fun one. Uh, I don't know if uh, you've seen this slide. I mean, that was actually uh, one of the uh, recent uh, Linux Foundation events um, that was presented by Jim, uh, Jim, Zell, uh, Jim from the Linux Foundation. Uh, the Octo project has been, basically put Linux on Mars. So I know if you missed that news, uh, if you want to learn more about that, I, th I thought it was a fun fact to share with everyone. Uh, there is this small module that actually runs Linux that has been used uh, for the Mars Insight project uh, last year. So if you want to learn more, I mean, you can ask Google how uh, you will find some interesting data. <laughs> Uh, that's a fun fact about the project. Uh, since uh, we've done the last both, uh, at, uh, it was at ELCE uh, last October, uh, the project and the developers have made a couple of releases and we are actually working on the next release for October. Uh, I just wanted to give like a, a couple of uh, numbers and raw numbers about uh, that shows, I mean, how much changes and what we are actually doing. I mean, how many people are get involved in the release and how many changes. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's definitely a significant amount of change for the size of the project and number of the developers. Uh, we've done a couple of stable releases. And as I said, we are marching toward the 3.0 release. Uh, and we are uh, in the middle of the cycle for now. Yeah, so uh, you uh, noticed that uh, we are actually switching, we've decided to switch from 2.7 to 3.0. Uh, the reason is actually on, on the next slide. Uh, we are uh, very happy about the state of the project for different reasons. Uh, many changes happened last year. Uh, so they are technical. Um, that's the, a lot of the uh, optimization and, and the recent changes are actually going to land for the next release. And so we are very happy with the state of the release and so happy that we actually want to change and make like a much bigger number. Um, so that's, uh, um, we've completely refreshed the hardware infrastructure that we use. Uh, you probably know that building uh, all the uh, Yoc20 open embedded recipes takes a sig significant amount of resources, so we refresh the infrastructure. We've completely uh, uh, redesigned the way we also do the testing. So we have now uh, pre-testing before the age of the merge. Uh, we run on um, all the testing on QMU and emulation on hardware like uh, x86 and ARM, uh, which is also new. So that's, uh, this is a significant release uh, that is going to happen in the next uh, few months. The next change uh, that also happened uh, this uh, last year, which is a, uh, not a technical change, but a very big change for the project, is uh, we've ratified a new government's <coughs> agreement and we have formalized the creation of the technical steering committee. So it's a big change for the project, the way it's organized. Uh, the TSC is made of five, uh, five, uh, five people. Uh, three are actually nominated and elected by the Yocto uh, members, board of members, and two are coming from uh, the open embedded uh, side of things. So you have the name here. And overall, the responsibility of the TSC is to uh, everything that relates to the Yocto project, all the git trees, any kind of issues with uh, maintenance, uh, the infrastructure, the testing, the release process, the compatibility program, everything that uh, deals with the, the, the Yocto project and, and that uh, this is now under the responsibility of the TSC. The goal is not to have the TSC decide and do everything, but when there are issues or when decision needs to be made and that the committee cannot reach to an agreement, we will actually go and use the TSC for that. There is a wiki as well uh, if you want more details. 
Okay, so one change uh, which we are going to do soon, uh, we've started to mention that on a couple of mailing lists, but the change is significant enough that we wanted to use uh, the opportunity today to have like uh, lots of, I mean, quite a bit of people in the room. Uh, we are going to change our mailing list. And uh, the mailing list is basically the heart of, I mean, everything that we do as an open source community. So it's a significant change. Uh, many projects have started to use uh, groups.io uh, and switching away from Mailman or new projects are actually using groups.io without never being able, uh, never used Mailman before. Uh, so this is, we are planning to make the change and Michael is in the room here uh, the week of uh, next, uh, the week of September 1st, the weekend of September 1st, which is a public holiday in the US. We hope that not so many emails will be sent that day. And uh, we will send instructions. Uh, if you are on the mailing list, we, we have 3,000 people on, actually on our mailing list. You will get all the instructions, all the account and everything. I just wanted to mention that this is going to happen. Uh, we will be on the hook to make sure that it does not uh, have too much impact on the workflow on anything. And for now, we are only going to do that for uh, yoctoproject.org mailing list. Uh, if everything happens and if everything goes well, uh, we will also plan the same migration for open embedded mailing list, uh, which is where most of the patch and most of the discussion happen. Uh, but yet, yeah, just so that you know. One small technical issue and that we have to highlight is that we have the name of the mailing list will change. We had to deal uh, with some DNS issues or limitations and so we are actually moving every list to uh, yoctoproject.org to list at uh, .yoctoproject.org. Again, if you have any questions, any concerns, if you if you hate groups.io or if you love groups.io and you want to talk about that, come to me or come to Michael in the room and we can discuss and chat um, about that. Uh, something else that I wanted to mention uh, also that we started uh, three, uh, three months ago, it's a quite an interesting story. Someone from the community uh, stepped up and came uh, to us, uh, to the advocacy mailing list of the project, and he wanted to contribute something, and it's time to the project. Uh, so Joseph uh, is based in Germany. I said, I want to basically start doing some live uh, streaming sessions of uh, me uh, and showing how to, what we can do and how we can actually use and start with the Yocto project. So it's meant to be uh, mostly for people who are start with the Yocto project, like an, an introduction sessions and how do I make my first bill and so on. So once every month, and we've done that for five times, I think already, uh, is coming and basically does like a simple thing, like uh, build my first image, uh, build my first recipe, make my first layers, and so on. So he's very open about what you will be talking next. The next session is on September 10. Uh, if you have not watched uh, yet, I encourage that you just have a look. Uh, if you have any idea about uh, what you would like Joseph to talk about, uh, let us know, we can give the idea. If you want to help Joseph and make your own session, that's also something we will welcome. It's a very interesting story because it came out of the blue uh, from the community. There are many ways you can actually contribute and help the project. I mean, it's not just sending patch or sending money. We also take patch and money, but uh, just doing anything like that is actually very welcome and we really, we are very happy that, uh, to, that, to see that. All the videos are also uploaded on the YouTube channel if you want to look at the past video. Uh, next thing, uh, which is also like a big thing which happens this year, uh, we are going to do the first ever uh, Yocto Project Summit. Uh, so if, you, if you're here and if you know the Yocto Project, you're probably familiar with the Yocto Dev Day. Uh, we've done that uh, many, many, many times. Uh, we used to do, have like a one day where some, uh, we give like uh, trainings about the Yocto Project and Open Embeddies. So realize that this is the trainings were sessions about uh, new things or uh, topics about the Yocto project. What we really wanted to do is slightly different. We want like a summit, like a conference about to, so that we uh, get a chance to have the developers and the users and everybody, I mean, that is actually involved with the project or just using the project to come together for like two days. Uh, the first day will be uh, mostly presentations and talks and we are actually opening for uh, CFP uh, right now. So there are instructions if you want to uh, uh, submit your own talk uh, and we will actually decide the agenda I think sometimes by uh, mid of September. Uh, we definitely encourage you to come and tell us about what you do. I mean, so you probably think you are not doing something very interesting with Zocto or maybe you think that everybody else is doing the same thing, but we, we really want to hear what you guys are doing with the Yocto project, whether you you make a product or whether you want have some contribution. I mean, we, we are very open about um, uh, hearing from you. So it will be the two days right after ELCE. Uh, it's in France, in Lyon, and uh, we'll have some uh, uh, reception, uh, evening, social event, uh, the first evening. And uh, yeah, you are very much uh, 
welcome to join. And yeah, so that's it in terms of, um, I mean, a couple of updates we wanted to share. So usually this buff is really up, up to you, I mean, to come and ask questions. So I'll, I'll go down and uh, I'll, I'll share the mic and we'll try to get uh, the answers. So we have a couple of people who can actually answer hopefully all the questions. If you don't have any questions, that's not going to be a really good buff. So I really encourage that <laughs> you come with questions. So who wants to start with the first question? Uh, what are the barriers to an LTS version of Yocto? Why do you start with the tough question? <laughs> you want to? Uh, it's a couple of things. Uh, the, the one that keeps stopping us uh, initially has been QA, keeping and maintaining the quality that we have for a previous release. Um, the other piece is mostly political. Like, how do you decide an LTS for the Yaka project? You know, who's going to make that decision? And, um, and obviously, the, the maintenance is you know who's going to maintain it and what they maintain. You know, do you continue doing what the stable branch maintainer does, or do you have something different? So it comes up every year or so uh, in the meetings. Yeah, yeah. So I like what were you what are you thinking of? So as Armin said, I mean, this is something which is, I mean, uh, one of the biggest requests we hear from everywhere. So this is an open source project. So I mean, the project is good at actually maintaining the, main, the master branch and adding new features. And I mean, that, that there is no doubt. Uh, the maintenance, um, right now, I mean, the options is to actually engage with someone. I mean, I actually will do that for you. Uh, about the project being able to actually itself do some LTS, I mean, some of them, I mean, like they, I mean, Ubuntu, or, I mean, this kind of model where one specific release would be maintained for maybe five years, uh, it boils down to actually uh, resources. And the problem, I mean, the, we, at, at this moment, we don't have resources. So if the, if the open source community by itself and for free is not going to do that, which is obvious, the other option would be to actually collectively, I mean, through uh, the Yocto project membership, for example, I mean, we would add more resources to actually do that. So that, would, I mean, this is something we could discuss. Uh, if there is enough members, uh, enough companies interested in joining the project and say, I mean, this is what we want. I mean, the, 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 the Yocto project is based on membership. So every people join, people vote, every decision is voted and so on. So if there is enough resources to do that, and if the membership agree to do that, that can happen. Uh, if it doesn't happen collectively for free by the open source community, it can happen in the membership. And if it doesn't happen in the membership, then you have to do it yourself. That's, that's it. So and the discussion we've had is yes, some people are interested. Some people could join if we were doing LTS. But right now, I mean, this has not materialized into something which exists. But that's something we discuss very often. Yeah, so we work in the same company and uh, we also have the same requirement for like seven years after the last sale. And we currently do maintain LTS for Krogot and Thought and we plan to maintain them for at least seven years. <clears throat> so, uh, and we, we also get approval to share 
our branches <clears throat> uh, somewhere on GitHub. So we plan to do this. Uh, if somebody is interested, they can just use our branches. But we obviously don't do the, the full um, testing cycles as Yocto does, but we do use them in production. So they are get tested in the like, main product uh, QA cycles. This is good, really good. Uh, the only issue, it gets tested for your very specific use case and product, yeah, which is not the same thing as being tested and certified as a release by the Octo project, but it's a first step. So again, I mean, the, I mean, the only answer, which is unfortunate, but the answer is, I mean, definitely, I mean, there is resource involved. So if there is enough people interested and willing to participate re and contribute resources, yes, I mean, we are very open to do that. Um, especially with the uh, what I mentioned earlier and all the improvement in the testing, a lot of the testing has actually become like uh, automated. So I mean, if we want to run more release, what we need is more computers to actually do the testing. I mean, to some extent. Um, so so yeah, that's there is a scalable process, but uh, we are uh, we still uh, I mean we will still I mean end up into uh, missing some of the resources. This part is mainly yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> but we are still we are doing better with automation still. We need him. Uh, we can tell you, I mean, Michael, you, Michael we, we can tell you what we have today, so. <clears throat> so the, the tests right now are running on two generations old, um, rather high-end Intel CPUs. They have at least two terabytes of storage and 128 gigabytes of RAM, and we use um, an NFS uh, backing for part of it, so we require 10 gigabit network on these machines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are fairly similar machines to what what you're using. I think we're at uh, 96 cores, but but very close. I just want to go back a little bit to the LTS discussion. And the question I always have, and I heard this discussion many, many times before, is what do people actually backport for more maintenance in LTS, and when do they stop backporting things? The question is, you know, when does the effort to do the backporting by far eclipse the effort to keep on a rolling, progressing uh, move forward? And, um, well, I don't have the perfect answer for that. Well, it's probably no perfect answer for that, but I would like to understand from people who are actually doing um, backporting, and I did some of that for some, some things, for some CPUs and things. Um, when When is it just not worth the effort anymore? And the other experience that I made is um, you can push moving on to a new release or so for that much time, but then the effort that you have to put in is a big, big step um, forward to move forward. And uh, for me, it always looked like it's easier um, to do small incremental continuous integration, um, keeping up to date with the new um, releases rather than doing the LTS and the backport effort. Anyone who want to share some experience about that LTS or any reason why people cannot upgrade? I mean, that could also be valid reason why people cannot keep up with the, anybody wants? So in, in our case, uh, we do re we do regular updates on our main development branch, but we have like stable branches that customer like to stick on them, and they expect only some minor bug fixes and security updates. And so that for that one, we are using kind of LTS model. So, but the the main like it it's too risky to update them because. Uh, the, the the stack the, the Yocto is not only the the part like it's only small part of the the whole software stack. So if we if you update Yocto, uh, it it has a ripple effect through 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 the whole software stack. So it it makes it not that stable branch anymore. Yeah, security and bug fixes.
so I think this is a good feedback. We can always take it to the AB. Um, but I think people have discussed all the pros and cons. And um, I think LTS, as with time, it has maintenance cost as increases. And I think so the, there are policies, like what policies do you want to institute? Like, do you want to do package upgrades? Are you doing new feature development that needs new libraries? Now, do you want to build, you know, backport new libraries or not? You know, what's your policy for LTS? So, and that defines a cost structure to it. And it's not something small. And for an open source project like this, you know, this is a big step. And we are certainly interested, as Nico said. Um, but again, you know, we are limited by our resources. So. Well, oh, well, I mean, the TSC for the decision about the policy, but the AB for the, the resourcing around the, the, the thing, yeah. So any more questions on LTS? I mean, that seems to be like the topic. <laughs> Oh, I think it was the same thing as the last, uh, last part from LTS came, came a lot. So maybe we should do something about it. Anyone? As I said, if you don't have any questions, that's, not a, that's an issue. Any experience? Oh. So this is going to be the uh, most important question of the day. How do you guys come up with the names for the code names for the releases? <laughs> uh, just in general, what's the primary reason behind the uh, code names? So the, 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 the algorithm is simple. Richard made the decision. So one day we just learned from Richard what's the, what the next release name is going to be. <laughs> that's, that's it. And so, yeah, that's, I mean. Oh, Chemnos. Okay. I think we have stories about the very first names, and then, I mean, we... Yeah, so, so th these are game characters, and earlier they didn't follow any convention, but now you will see that they are in, you know, chronological, or like, you know, they are alphabetical order, at least. So, yeah, so I think, but they are totally random, there is no logic behind them, as such. Yeah. yeah, I think the, the latest alphabetical series has been from Total Annihilation, and Zeus is probably the last one in that series, yeah. so there'll be a new video game. <laughs> um, I know there were several people that wanted to ask about CVEs. Are they in the audience? So I think it comes to the same LTS conversation. Um, I was involved in Yocto over a year now, and uh, one of the first impressions was, it's great, it's used by everybody, but why do we have so many CVs in these stable products? It just doesn't make sense. Then I realized that uh, every single company is doing their own CV, backport business. Nobody's actually giving it back, maybe a few companies. I think Intel is doing a great job. And I think I also saw um, Garmin as well. So I think the, as a user, it gives bad impression that, you know, we have all these vulnerabilities, nobody's addressing them. So what do we feel about this? So the question is who wants to answer this one? <laughs> So yeah, contribute them, right? <laughs> Nobody's saying no. Uh, essentially, we have what we have, and I think that's a good feedback. Um, but I think, um, as you can see, that most of projects, you know, who is doing the security updates, you know, um, project at itself, they do based upon what they can do, but mostly these are like deployed products who do this and then upstream them. So my request here is to everybody who's using Yocto project to upstream as much as they can, their CVEs. So, you know, that's a collective way to fix it. Um, we don't run like, you know, a separate team that we can afford that here is our security response team, right? So I don't think we, we can do that. But, but yeah, I think I, my request is there for everyone to, you know, upstream their fixes as they find. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to add that. Holy. That uh, it's uh, as you can see, like the every release is pretty cutting edge. Like right now, you look at it and we're like a five point two kernel five point two dot nine or something, and then GCC is like at nine point two, and Bing Utils at two thirty two. So every release, we try to keep up with like the closest that we can to what what's upstream, and that is kind of a reason why sometimes a lot of CVEs come right because we release with the latest possible version, but at the same time. It's it's hard to maintain that version for a long time. Uh, th there's a process issue as well. If you have a CVE for Thud, I can't take it a stable branch maintainer unless it goes into Warrior first, and it is done in, in uh, Master as well. So you can send the patches, but they may not land in a stable branch unless everything up you know up before that gets fixed. And it's like who who does that? Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make. Uh, so when you fix CV in the stable branches, it's still alive. Um, sometimes you up upgrade the version of the package. Sometimes you apply the patches. So what the uh, general logic you're using? <laughs> Anything else? Anyone? I want to follow up on this. I think what uh, I was expecting is a kind of mailing list where every company has some packages that they care about and uh, they share the CVEs and take some work, right? So it's not, we can't expect everybody to do all the work, but rather to create that communication environment. I can say, I care about Binitils, so I'm going to take care of this. And then the next person takes care of the something else, right? I don't even see that right now. So that's bothering me. And so you mean like a mailing list on the Yocto project? I mean. Yeah. I'll just say most of the work in CVEs has been done by the commercial partners, our mentor, ourselves, Monte Vista, and a lot of it's going straight to upsource, as per uh, Cam was saying. So that communication is happening, but it's kind of happening directly between the companies. So our, our circuit lead, Mark Hatley, talks directly to other partner companies. So it's not really happening through Yachter Project, but it's happening, and we're all contributing back to Yachter Project. So we're not using Yachter Project as a center for CVEs because there's no staffing, but it is definitely happening because it's crucial to our business and everyone else's business. And so it's happening, it's just not happening in a visible way. So, and I think when you, we talked together earlier, and I think there is value in making it more visible because people ask and they don't realize a lot is going on with their CV process with the Octa project. They're just not visible. And as you say, there is a security mailing list. It's just quiet because, as I say, most of the communication is outside of that. So I just want to say there, there's a lot, lot going on. So what would it take to uh, make this discussion more public? Right? So you take that as a feedback? Yeah, we're taking that part. Okay, okay. So a long time ago, I met with some Toshiba folks, uh, and they were working on a project to uh, build Yocto using Debian sources, and their motivation was for IoT devices that had long lifespans. Um, and their mo in further, by using Debian sources, they could take advantage of LTS Debian and their uh, management of CVEs to provide updates. Um, I admit I haven't looked into that project in a while, but is there anyone around that 
knows the uh, status of that or if that's even viable, what the challenges are with that kind of approach as opposed to using the project. I think that's the meta Debian layer, right? Yeah. yeah. Anybody has used that or wants to talk about the layer? Except Kim? <laughs> no? Yeah, yeah, so I think that's an interesting approach. Um, I think it's still alive. They still are following up. You can see some talks they did in this conference. I forgot when the last one was in Europe, I think. Um, so uh, it's an interesting approach um, for for the project in general. Um, you know, we target you know across build systems, and what you end up in doing is you know just not sources, but also patches and this and all. So um, you end up basically you know creating additional shim that you have to maintain on top. So it's quite a bit of work rather than just simply you know pointing to Debian sources and building. The reason how they store sources is also not very you know homogeneous. Right? In some cases, it's some Git. You know, they'll commit into the Git, and in some cases, it is like you know a tarball, and then they will patch it. And so, uh, you know, if you have to do something like that, uh, I would see that it has to be wholesome. So, and you cannot go case by case basis because Debian has like seventy-five thousand patches, uh, packages, or something like that. So uh, I would rather concentrate on you know creating a process that we have for the project and you know concentrate on that one, and uh, maybe collaborate with other projects like Debbie and others and you know that gentleman was saying there to have our security mailing list and what needs are there, um, and approach it from that way rather than you know s kind of sneaking in through into the Debian by building the sources. I think it's not a viable approach uh, in the long term. Um, because you know they do change things, right? And at that time, you will be like again, um, you might have to change your formats and stuff like that. So um, I would think that the effort-wise, it's probably a more progressive effort if you had like the security working group or you know some ways to share your uh, CVEs and bug fixes like that. I think and that would be uh, probably a lesser effort also. Because in this case, you're not marrying two very different build systems. So, that's it. I know what's that. Civil infrastructure planning. Thanks. Anybody wants to talk about any experience or anything that you guys are doing with the Yocto projects? Any things that pain points? I mean, I would be surprised if there are no pain points. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't gonna talk about pain points, um, but I, what I was gonna ask is besides the stuff that we've discussed, um, is there a to-do list you guys have for people who are interested in contributing directly? Uh, yes, so there are a few things that the project is doing. Um, so first there are uh, meetings, like there is a monthly technical meeting that I mean is open to everyone, so I mean the key, uh, the core developers join, and that's where I mean some of the key new features are being discussed or new issues, I mean, so that's uh, every first Tuesday of the month, something like that. Uh, so that's one thing. So I mean, that's would if you are an experienced developer, that would be the right place to actually start and just come and talk. Uh, then I mean, we heavily rely on Bugzilla. So I mean, the Bugzilla is full of things to do. Uh, so at the beginning of the cycle, uh, we do like a planning phase. So we look at everything that exists in Bugzilla, and we try to say, okay, this is going. This we can do. This we can do. This we cannot do. So there, during the planning phase, you can also help and like pick some tasks and say, I'm committing to actually doing this task for the next release. Uh, so that would be one way. Uh, recently, what we started also, we had people who said that we want to contribute, but this is way too difficult. How do we start? So we have these newcomers. I think we send an email once every week or once every two weeks, uh, where when we, whenever we find something on Bugzilla, we find something that is very trivial. We don't do it. We don't fix it, and we tag it as something for somebody who is new to actually come and start. So there is a newcomer list somewhere on the wiki 
so which is really, I mean, and, and like what I said at the beginning, this is for somebody who is just sending your first patch. So, I mean, this is like trivial patches, uh, sometimes just like uh, fixing the world or something like that, but at least it's lear learning through how to actually contribute and how to work with our community. So we do this, I mean, on, on the two different sides. So for the very first few patches or, or if you want to contribute and, and really contribute to the release and be part of the technical team. Does it answer the question? Or? Yeah. We have a weekly, uh, every Thursday morning, we have a weekly uh, bug triage. So whatever failed at the builds or what uh, bugs came in, we look at it and say, who's going to fix what? What goes into the newcomer's bucket and things like that? Yeah, that's actually even more than that. Uh, we have a triage team, a squat team, which is actually rotating. So we have like a SWAT team, sorry. That's the build people. Okay. That's different. Uh, so, uh, yes, but that, so there's basically five, six people which we rotate every every week or, or so, and the, the role of these guys is just to monitor for build failures and report and try to do like the first pass analysis. So if you have someone and if you want to actually help the project, that's very helpful. Uh, it's testing master and master next, and we need someone. I mean, there are issues and sometimes it's not an issue, sometimes it's, so we need someone to do actually the first step triage. So that would be one way. So if you, if you, if you have people that actually want to start engaging and, and work with that, you can also come to Armin and I and we can actually help you with that. Uh, you can also look at the, the Yocta project wiki and then there's the, the planning is there and the features per release are there. And actually it gives you a summary of the Box that are planned for every milestone, and and what the their priorities base basically. So if you if you're interested in some in fixing something, uh, you can go ahead and, and just fix it. Uh, how many people use like the SDK or the extendable SDK or Dev Dev Tool? Okay, because we're kind of looking for somebody to take on the technology to maintain it because we don't have maintainers for that. So that would be a good place to get involved if you like. Otherwise, we may drop them. We found the maintainers. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I don't know if I, I can maintain it, but we certainly put uh, uh, DevTools not able to uh, run menu config for the kernel as well. So it's a different flow. Uh, some people like DevTools, some people like BitBake. It works for, for some. Uh, and I, I I would just say that I wouldn't l like to die. <laughs> no, there's, it, it's useful. It's definitely useful. Okay. Thanks. That might be a topic that's a bit petty with the rest of the discussion that's happening here, but uh, I was gonna, you mentioned if we have pain points. Um, before talking about pain points, I just wanna mention that I enjoy Yocto a lot. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> always amazed that it can build for seven hours and it actually de delivers something that you can run on your system. To me, it's still uh, incredible. Uh, anyway, so there are many pain points. Um, on the flip side, uh, one of them that uh, I, I, I stumble across a lot is uh, estate mismatch. And I've, I've, I've found in the manual that there is a, a bitbake minus s printf that'll try to explain why it's not matching. But I'm having so much difficulty finding information in there. And I'm not sure how it works, how it traces back um, 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 if, if it goes to the estate mirrors to find possible targets and which uh, estate it um, finds as the possible, the nearest match and how it compares. But I find a lot of times I, I, I will dig for, because I'm trying to save hours, right? When it, when it triggers a build of one or two components, I don't mind. But when it triggers a build of libc, then I'm in for you know the full rebuild. And I don't understand why sometimes, so it's kind of weird. I'm just wondering if there are tools that I'm missing or analysis that I'm not performing correctly. I mean, a hint that I can, I can give is that we have a CI infrastructure, so our, our builds are being performed inside Docker containers and each inside GitLab. And each of the runners actually will rsync the estate folder back to a central server that we maintain. 
right? So each each one contribute, and so we have a central, I think we use the estate mirror variables to declare, and it's a simple HTTP uh, serve of all of our estate folder. And it, it looks like it doesn't go there to find the diff and the possible candidate. So it's always trying to find something on my machine as a possible candidate, and it's diffing against that. And so first of all, the setup you use is very common. So many people use that. So I mean, there, there is nothing wrong with the setup. Uh, which tool did you say that you are using? This. And and you are on recent version of Yocto. I mean, not. So um, I think you have to also look at what you're building, right? So if you're rebuilding libc, for example, then all bets are off, right? So the, so the reason is because, um, and I think there, uh, if you were at Yocto Dev Day, there was a talk on hash equivalency. So there is a new feature that is being implemented, which basically is trying to weed out you know, some trivial changes you do in recipes, and that results in rebuilds, right? But if you are kind of making a real change, say, into libc, we do not yet have a mechanism to detect ABI change, right? So we might have fixed a bug, really not change any API from glibc. Uh, ideally, you don't need to rebuild it. Right, if you're not doing static linking, you know, so, but we cannot detect that. So we have to be conservative, right? So there are tools, and we talked about that here as well, where you, you can do like ABI compliance check, and if nothing changes, you don't have to change your hash. But these are technologies that are a little complex right now. So what happens is if you are patching, it will go and rebuild all the dependencies. Thinking that the patch you change might have a transitive dependency that will kind of you know reflect onto other packages. So that's one reason why it will result in rebuilds. Well, most of the time, though, I wouldn't change anything. That is a problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. So there is a tool called uh, Bifsig. Yes, so uh, what it will do is, if you use Bitbake diffsig, it's going to tell you why he is building it compared to what's the difference, why it is thinking that it has to redo that task. So that task will give you actually down to a variable. That variable is causing it to think that it should rebuild it. So that way you can debug it, right? And I think we do use uh, shared state cache quite a bit on auto builders. And um, so I think certainly we do a lot of testing um, you know, on the auto builder as well, where we generate a state cache exactly like you and then we consume it from different builders. So you invoke shared cache Yeah, so there's a tool. I think it's documented. Yeah, it's called uh, bitbake dash diffsig, D I F F S I G. You can target a recipe, you can target a task within the recipe, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, I think that's uh, certainly possible. I mean, there are, possibly there are issues, I don't deny those, but I think there's a lot of testing we do on estate. On your recipe or on the core recipe?
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I think, um, um, you know, if, uh, you could also go to the mailing list and start a discussion, provide the feedback. Hey, you know, this is what's happening and we can take it there. Certainly open for all kind of issues. I think we take them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, certainly I think Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think, um, you know, for example, you know, one of the reasons is if you don't use Uninative, right? We have had that kind of problems in the past. So we have provided a Uninative, which is basically a uniform environment, right? So very important you use it, you use it for consistency to use a state across, say your builder is running a different operating system, right? Yeah. Say it's running Debian and your host is Ubuntu, right? So using that helps quite a bit for it to not confuse the native packages, for example. If you are using Pocky, then it is, it is already enabled. Yeah. Right, so, so you already have it enabled. It's called so, uni native, so if you look at the conf file, you will see it. So, so yeah, it could be something, you know, um, a bug or something, you know. You, well, yeah, that's good. I don't have to convince you then. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was being polite. But, um, but yeah, you know, on serious note, you can just uh, reach out on, uh, on mailing list and you know, we'll certainly help you out. I think there is a nice wiki somewhere in the Yocto uh, wiki that explains how to debug the uh, hash mis mismatch. Uh, but you, I think the, the easiest way, if you have two hashes that are, like you usually say, so you have these two hashes that mismatch, in stamps directory, you can find the, the signature data. Uh, this, it's like compressed files. And then use the tool uh, like the bitbake-dumpseq or diffseq. And if you ha have these two files, you can see what's the difference. And then you can fi find variables that are uh, different between your two builds. It's usually like date or, or some past name. But I mean, the setup you use is the one we use on the auto builder. I mean, the, I mean, we have a shared state and we have like uh, 10 different machines that build, I mean, keep building all the time. So, I mean, there is nothing wrong with this on the setup side, at least that, that, that you know. One last question maybe, yeah. Um, this isn't quite a question directly so much, well, it's a question, but it's a follow-on to the signature stuff, um, because I've done the same thing um, many times, because there's three or four of us in the company that understand Yocto, and there's 800 developers, and so when something happens in the, you know, that, that corrupts, or not, yeah, that corrupts their environment so that they're seeing three hour build time suddenly. Um, it's worth several days of my time to go dig it out and figure it out. Um, and a huge chunk of the time, uh, I, I see, you know, there are recipes that take a long time to build. Um, and those are the ones that I tend to see the issue on where I can see, okay, this is building and it shouldn't be, but oftentimes, quite frequently, in fact, um, the issue is not that recipe and its source or something like that, but a dependency. And if you look at the bitbake bit diffsigs output, 
um, you know, it basically just tells you, oh, hey, the hash for this dependency changed. And so you have to go into that hash file and the corresponding one in both cases and do that diff and then another layer up and then another layer up continuously unwrapping the onion until you finally get to the top where something actually changed or there's a variable somewhere that shouldn't actually be included or should be in the, um, uh, what is it, hash base whitelist. Um, so my question is, has anybody worked on creating any semblance of a recursive version of the BitBake diff sigs tool or thought about it? should search that. So the search order is that it will search locally. If it doesn't find it, it will go, if you have mirrors, it will go to the mirrors. But it's looking for a hash because it's known. No, it will calculate a hash. And if you... Yes. So... Yeah, so if you have built something, right, and that is on your estate mirror, that will have a signature and now you're trying to build it, it's going to calculate the dependency signature, and then it goes on the hunt for signature match, right? So if you have built this signature before, it'll go and fetch it. Which means, right. No, there is no nearest. There is either match or no match. Yeah, there is match or no match, right? So. Because, see, if one thing changed, it could change whole things, right? So, mm -hmm. so, okay, so I think it could be that first time you are there and it's not creating a hash locally, right? Because there is no local downloaded equivalent estate. Um, that could be a corner case. We might have to look at it that it's not able to then give you uh, a hash that it has calculated to compare against something because it needs two versions to compare, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. So there has to be a policy for it for the access. So. Yeah, you have to give it. Yeah. You have to know which one is. I mean, which one was the last one? You have to know. We don't know it. Nobody knows. Yeah. So, so I think that is something probably an item that you could bring up on mailing list, or maybe as a. Um, we might have some clarifications in there, and then it could be a feature we could implement if it's missing. It could be tied to the build history. I mean, we could record in the build history what were the last things that we build and the last hashes. So then when you build the next one, you, you know at least what is the last state that you were in. So maybe that could be that. I mean. Yeah, but I think it's more of like what to compare to. That's not an easiest job. Yeah. Right? It's build history. Uh, I mean, it's the estate caches job. The, the build history will keep a history of what has been built. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could also record, I mean, with the hashes that were used to make that build. So the next time we build, I mean, we actually have the previous hashes. So, yeah. so I think what he is explaining, as I understand, is that you don't have any local estate, right? And you build it, and it doesn't find a match. 
and he hasn't made a change and it doesn't match it when it should match and now he can't debug it either right yeah but yeah so there has to be a search policy where you can define preferences and stuff so that's actually a whole different game or in most cases you could hit with, with all of them and right like you could have a hit with all of them and i mean one would be the right one <laughs> yeah so it's something that i think yeah Yeah. So, so let me, yeah, I think, I think it definitely could be something we could enhance, right? Uh, it could be something that you are doing that's causing this behavior. Um, no, no, don't say that. What we say is if you don't post on the list, you don't get access. Yeah. That's what we're saying. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I mean, enough people, I mean, I guess, I mean, this is also interested as now, I mean, now that you've told the story, I mean, yeah. I'm sure your email will be read and, and processed. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting situation. And that's, uh, So, so, so when I, when I, when I debug these and I debug them a lot, um, generally what happens is I'll have a build, uh, I'll basically start with no at local SDA cache and remove temp and do a build. And then basically when it gets to the very absolute first thing that it tries to build, I basically take that and uh, generate the signatures and try looking through the signatures. Because if you, if you, I think if you could say just one, it'll tell you all the things that's using to calculate the signature. And if you look through those, oftentimes you can see, oh, I've got a path in here that's a local path or something of that nature, and that's what's causing it, and so I need to go and whitelist that. Um, so that's usually my, my first step, is basically clear out the workspace, do a build, and see the very first thing, kill the build, and generate the signatures for that. And just, just look, at the, look through the signatures that it's using to calculate the hash, and usually, often, you know, you'll find, oh, there's a straight time date, or, yeah, it basically, basically what happens is, is it's a dependency tree, right? And the, the one hash at the very beginning cascades through the whole system. So starting at the very beginning, the very first thing that starts building that it fails. Okay. Yeah, yeah, basically start at the very beginning and ju just generate the signatures, look through the signatures, and you'll often find there's a date tag or something, something of that nature that, that is triggering the whole thing. Yeah, you can also tell Bitbig to just do the set scene tasks. It makes you look really smart in front of your coworkers. <laughs> well, you want it to run the set scene tasks so it does all the S state it can, and then dry run after that, and you'll see everything that it would have built that wasn't an S state. That way you don't actually do the build on their laptop, but you run as much set scene, and that way you can figure out where. You can at least pairs it down a lot, right? I forget what the option is. But there is a manual. <laughs> okay, so we any any last questions or are we done? One more. Ah, okay. Uh, is somebody using reproducible builds, and what's your experience? How much reproducible packages did you are you getting? I'm not using them, but I'm writing test cases for them. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think the plan, um, they're very close to passing. So the, I think the plan there is to write um, test cases that will run on the auto builder to make sure that core image minimal and core image sado are reproducible. And Richard really wants to get that in for 3.0. 
Um, what is the main, like, who's driving this group? Who's your group? Um, right now it's me and um, uh, Ross has been helping too. Uh, well, it's it's really important for hash equivalents, um, and I'm not sure what the other use case. Oh, I know people have other use cases just because they want binary reproducible builds. You will have issues right now with the infra. The infra is there, but we have to patch um, packages. Right now, in our recipes, you know, there are packages which use date and then time and stuff like that. So I can't tell you, like, you know, a number, what percent it is. But right now, I think you can't build an image where you don't have one package that is not, I mean, that is, you'll have at least one that will fail. So, yeah, so, but I think it's it's progressing. I, I think once the testing goes in, you know, what, what um, Josh is doing, I think that's, that's actually pretty good. Um, thereafter, I think you know we can basically enable it on world builds, and you know we can get a lot more information on what all is failing, basically, right? So. So it yeah. So we are working on it. Um, we want. Yeah. Okay, good. So it's always like that. We don't have any questions and then we can't stop anymore. <laughs> so uh, thanks everyone. Uh, again, I mean, we really like, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, it's not a lot of time, but uh, we, I mean, most of these guys, I mean, uh, are at this conference all the time. So you can find us at the Yocto booth uh, somewhere, anywhere. So you can always uh, come and ask questions and you can obviously always use a mailing list. So uh, thank you for coming today. And uh, yeah, thanks for your feedback uh, about the project. Thanks. Thank you.